Hi, my name is Holly. I'm program manager at Edison Ford Winter Estates. And this month we're talking about the Naval Reserve Board and the Naval Consulting Board. And as I was doing this presentation, I learned a lot that I hope to share with you. Um, and I'm blocking this, so I'm gonna kind of duck down for a second. And that is Thomas Edison in the middle. That is a preparedness parade in 1916 in New York to um, be prepared in the event of war. Thomas Edison, the Naval Consulting Board and Naval Research Laboratory. And I divided it up into two different parts. This it's actually an intertwined story, but I thought it would be easier to follow. And this is the first picture of the Naval Consulting Board when they met. Just a little background. I'm not a World War I expert, the Great War, as it was called at the time, because we didn't know there'd be a second World War. But I'll give you a basic overview that the Great War began on June 28th, 1914, with the assassinations of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie. They were visiting Sarajevo, Bosnia, and that had been recently annexed into the Austrian Empire, something that doesn't exist today. And Austria-Hungary, with German encouragement, declared war on Serbia in July, and Russia's support of Serbia brought France into the conflict. Germany declared war on Russia on August 1st and France on August 3rd. And Germany's violation of the Belgian neutrality and British fears of German domination in Europe brought Brit Great Britain into the war. And so right now, President Wilson is saying, we will not be entering this war. So keep this in mind, that's not going to happen. We're going to stay neutral. Unlike his friend, Henry Ford, who was a pacifist, Thomas Edison believed in preparedness. In response to possible threats against the United States, and I have to read this because it's a quote, he told the New York Times in October, 1915, the soldier of the future will not be a saber bearing, bloodthirsty savage, he will be a machinist. Future military conflicts, he believed, would be wars in which machines, not soldiers, fight. I don't think we've got more machines, but still men and women go to war and they die. So that was maybe a partial right on his part. In another interview, several weeks later, Edison remarked, science is going to make war a terrible thing. Too terrible to contemplate. Pretty soon we can be mowing men down by the thousands or even millions almost by pressing a button. Oh, well, unfortunately, that is true. This is Edison at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1915. This is the Lusitania. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. On May 7th, 1915, a German U-boat, which is a German submarine, torpedoed and sank the passenger line of Lusitania off the coast of Ireland. Almost 1,200 passengers and crew, including 128 Americans, died that day. And that Thinking of that made people realize the role that submarines could play in modern warfare, at least at that time. And Edison gave a speech in May 1915, which he called for stockpiling of airplanes, battleships, munitions, and so on, and having trained Army reservists, trained by private industry, and to develop new inventions quickly. He proposed creating military research laboratories. It was reported that Edison's views on military preparedness attracted the attention of Secretary of Navy, Josephus Daniels. And just a brief aside here, if you read about Joseph, Josephus Daniels, he was a lawyer, but most of his life, he was a newspaper editor. He was also a, a strong white supremacist and segregationist and and all around, perhaps not, definitely not um, an example of um, being kind to all people and a very discriminatory individual. And I just wanted to slip that in there so that you knew I was aware of what type of person he was. So it's supposedly, uh, pay attention to this part because it said that Josephus Daniels hears Edison's, uh, reads what he wrote and he, writes to Edison on July 7th, 1915, inviting him to lead a group of civilian experts to advise the Navy on military technology. Edison agreed if he would not have to manage the administrative details and be free to um, pursue his own war-related research. So he'll be working with the Navy, but he'll also be doing his own thing for his business. 
and realize that Edison is extremely hard of hearing, which is going to affect a lot of things going on here. However, what I learned is according to the Edison papers, the board that wasn't inspired by Edison's speech or writing. It was inspired by Edison's assistant, his engineer, Miller Reese Hutchinson. The board was his idea. It wasn't anybody else's. So Josephus Daniels didn't say, wow, great, we need this guy. No, what he says is, um, let's sell some batteries as part of Edison Industries, Edison Businesses. That's something that could happen. Miller Reese Hutchinson is going to sell them to the U.S. Navy. Hutchinson believed the way to gain an edge against Edison's rivals in business would be to work from the inside of the Navy. Interesting. And he had been in the military, by the way. So we have two schools of thought here that everyone was so blown away by Edison that the Secretary of the Naval Navy reaches out to him or that Edison's chief engineer, Miller Reese Hutchinson, reaches out to the Secretary of Navy and has this happen. And why would he do that? Well, so he could sell storage batteries. And why does he want to do that? Because he gets a five-figure commission on every one he sells. And you can use storage batteries in a lot of things, including on submarines. Just a little bit about Hutchinson. He was actually a very intelligent man, an engineer. He'd been in the military, but he started hanging around Edison in West Orange, New Jersey, giving tours of his laboratory. He did this for several years until notice was taken of him. Edison grows interested in him. They start working together. He knows how to communicate with Edison by either shouting or tapping in Morse code. So keep this all in mind. There's another agenda. Now we got the Naval Consulting Board, but we also have Edison's companies trying to sell and his storage batteries are one of his more profitable things. In a letter in July 7th, 1915, Daniels first made his claim to the press about Edison's interview that led him to create the board and invite Edison to head it. But there were two drafts of Daniels' July 7th letter dated May 31st, so they're written on Memorial Day. And Daniels, that day, is at Arlington Cemetery. And they were having ceremonies there honoring the dead. And it's highly unlikely that anyone in the Navy Department had time on that day to write to Edison. The Edison papers at Rutgers was a great source for learning new information. I've just seen this in the last few years. Um, the original draft of reaching out to the Secretary of the Navy was composed by Hutchinson on a dictating machine. But there's two documents with slight variations. Um, you know why? Because they this the dictating machine, the uh, people that transcribe it, they interpret words differently and voice recordings differently. But they are incorporated into Daniel's July 7th letter along with parts of a third draft made by Lewis Howe. He was secretary to the assistant secretary of the Navy. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Daniel's first letter included about 75% of Hutchinson's draft. Remember, Hutchinson is giving them some action from the military, some things they can make for them. Um, Daniel's fi final letter was about 75%. And Hutchinson later on, many years later, wrote to Daniel's during the 30s and took credit for producing the idea of the Naval Consulting Board. And that's from some papers in Rutgers University and articles, Hutchinson claimed he hired Edward Marshall to interview Edison and that he paid Marshall's expenses to DC to bring the interview that was done by the Times to Daniel's attention. And Daniels never disagrees with him. And when he's done being the Secretary of the Navy, eventually he will become an ambassador in Mexico. But kind of all these things going on in the background. And here's Miller Reese Hutchinson probably in his third, late, later 30s, somewhere in there. And what is he doing? He's tapping a Morse code like Mina also would do to communicate with Edison. And sometimes people would, un would have to raise their voice so he would know what's going on. So he really is not going to be able to run a board meeting without someone there to assist him, without Morse code, without shouting in his ear, which would not always be possible. The board was composed of two representatives from each of the prof 11 professional engineering societies. 
Miller Reese Hutchinson and Thomas Edison. And by the way, uh, there's engineers and other things, but there are no scientists. And that was a deliberate um, technology people. Edison deliberately didn't want a scientist on there. So there's two representatives from each of those, plus Miller Reese Hutchinson and Thomas Edison. And the Naval Consulting Board first met on October 7th, 1915 at the Navy Department. Edison was elected chairperson, which I will tell you was a mere formality, and his chief engineer, Miller Reese Hutchinson, was chosen as his personal assistant. And so Edison is appointed chairperson, but he's not going to be actually running most of those meetings. He really can't hear, um, so it would not be possible. Plus, he wants to be busy doing his research. He doesn't want to be sitting around in a meeting. And one of the first, board's first tasks was to evaluate suggestions for the public for inventions. And it was pretty unproductive. There's 11th, I don't know why they ever did this, but maybe they thought they'd be including the public. And remember, the United States isn't in this war yet, by the way. There's 11,000 ideas gone over by the board and only 110 of them would even be seriously considered. And only one, which is called the Ruggles or Orinti Orintur, a forerunner to the flight simulator, was produced and implemented by the US Navy. So here's a group, and I, you might recognize somebody over here. Do you know who that is? That's uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who will go on to become President of the United States. So at one point, um, he is working for the Secretary of the Navy, Daniels, but ultimately he will become president and report, um, appoint Daniels as the ambassador to Mexico. Uh, and this is from 1912, a group of people that Edison worked with um, called the Insomnia Squad, or sometimes they're muckers because they would stay up so late. And that's them in the laboratory after a, a late night. Um, he, Edison, as I had mentioned, is gonna play a ceremonial role as a chairperson because he wasn't interested in the bureaucracy. The first vice chair, William Saunders, and Secretary Thomas Robbins primarily conducted the administrative work until the start of 1917. Edison was focused on erecting chemical plants at his facility in Silver Lake, New Jersey, to produce phenol and other chemicals that were previously imported from Germany. So yes, he had done interactions with Germany before the war, and there's now a shortage. And the chemical works would play a significant role in the manufacture of several Edison invented products, such as the nickel alkaline storage battery, which will be coming up shortly on, and phonograph records. And that's from something at the National Park Service. And then, so this group is, um, just, just to give you an idea how Edison worked, he worked around the clock. So Edison is part of the Naval Consulting Board, working to um, help the Navy with ideas, but he also has his own business going on and that needs to be promoted. And that's what Miller Reese Hutchinson, his chief engineer was doing. And things had been going along swimmingly very successfully, but there's a problem. The first submarine to be fitted with an Edison storage battery exploded at the Brooklyn Navy Yard on January 15th, 1916, it killed five men and severely injured other, 10 others. The ship was in dry dock at the time and undergoing modifications to its battery installation, that Edison battery. Rescuers had to don oxygen helmets before entering the sub was filled with fumes. Now, Daniels believes in this submarine battery, but there was too much, there was, the, it was vehement objections to it after this happened. What's the most likely pro, um, reason this happened? Um, he's not taking responsibility, but it is believed that Hutchinson didn't properly explain to the uh, lieutenant that commanded the submarine what um, how to what to do about the hydrogen because they were aware that hydrogen could come out and perhaps uh, cause them difficulties. Um, it was a hydrogen blast. And Hutchinson immediately goes on the defensive and said it could be a hundred different things instead of taking responsibility. And he blamed the disaster on lack of pro proper ventilation. And that was an unknown spark that 
caused it. So at this point, there's big trouble. Daniels has to uh, appoint a board, an independent board to see what happened. And so there's this hearing and Hutchinson says three submarines. Uh, he just said a foreign Navy uses Edison's battery too. And he says three submarines equipped with them have had no defect and he's taking no responsibility. And he's calling out the Lieutenant that commanded this uh, submarine and he's blaming it on them. And he really, he did them no favors. There's this, there's this court of inquiry. It seems like he didn't tell them exactly what they needed to do. Maybe he did a little bit of a rush job and should have accepted a good portion of the responsibility, but that did not happen. Um, so this is what ends up happening with all those people that died when it settled and Edison denies responsibility at this point, though he was not happy with Hutchinson. So what happens is that Edison ends up at the end of the day paying out about $66,000. Of course, it's worth a lot more today, but still with everything that happened. And it seemed like it was something that was just, in my opinion, I'm not scientific, but that it was just carelessness, particularly on the part of Hutchinson that caused this to happen. And in March, shortly thereafter, in March, of that year, Edison is in front of the House Naval Affairs Committee. And he's in there and the, pe the people in the room, these are Congress people, they are mesmerized by Edison. He's kind of blunt, kind of enthusiastic, outspoken. And also people are discovering how very deaf he is and how he depended on Hutchinson at this point, I guess he wasn't tapping in Morse code. He was shouting out things to him so he could answer them. So guess what? He's in front of this Naval Affairs Committee talking about wanting a naval research lab. But that explosion had just occurred two months before. And maybe because of a combination of factors, respect, his, his hearing impairment, um, just his whole persona, they never asked him about this explosion. And to me, this just says that if he was doing this role originally, he probably should not have been still in business for himself as well. So at one point, the Navy wanted five million. I'm gonna talk more about the lab later on, but he's gonna get them to modify it down. But this is the part about this story, even though he's talking about the Naval Research Lab and I'm talking about it a little later on, these representatives were in awe of them. And he tells them how he would run this Naval Research Lab and how it would be mostly civilians, not the Navy running it. And he tells them all about how, what, how many people he would use. And he said he would, um, he just had them in awe, mesmerized. He just says you have to pay people well enough to be there to not go to work for someone else. So at the end of the day, they, one of the congressmen says, I move that we rise as a expression of our respect and appreciation. So 21 congressmen stood and applauded Edison as he gathered up his plans and left the table. Very unique happening there. So these batteries, no more, not in service, even though they probably could have been used if the proper precautions were taken. Moving on, in January 1970, Edison outfitted a special laboratory near his West Orange, New Jersey lab to evaluate equipment for locating gun positions by sound. In the spring of 1917, he continued these experiments at Sandy Hook, New Jersey Naval Station. From August to October, he spent six weeks on the Long Island Sound conducting experiments on the USS Sachem, 186 foot private yacht that the Navy had acquired for his research. Much of Edison's research was on protecting ships from submarine attack. 
He also has researched ways to turn ships under the torpedo attack and equip the sachem with electrical instruments to detect submarines by sight, sound, and magnetic field. And Edison spent 18 months in the field producing 48 projects, including a hydrogen detecting alarm to prevent the dangers of undersea explosions. And you remember what happened with that battery when it was in dry dock. Vaseline and zinc antitrust coating for submarine guns and anti-roll platform for ships to ensure accuracy in rough seas. And here he is on the stage with the Navy. So he's working with um, enlisted men and officers. And what was interesting, remember his hearing loss and the Hutchinson is gonna be back working in the laboratory uh, back in New Jersey. He really can't hear. So Mina joins them. And boy, oh boy, this is what they called it back then, a very dated phrase, but you know, they weren't fans of petticoats on the ship, meaning that they weren't fans. This is before the Navy has women as active duty. They weren't fans of Mina being there, uh, but Mina needed to be there because Edison with his hearing loss just could not function without somebody kind of interpreting for him. He is truly virtually deaf and he does do Morse code, but he never, you know, went along with hearing aids. I believe at one point Ford tried to do that for him. He doesn't learn American Sign Language. One interesting thing is that at this point, Edison uh, has some ideas, like um, he could have a way of camouflaging ships, which was a really viable uh, option. But at this point, Daniels is, wants them to be more on the attack instead of like just being defensive. So perhaps that is why some of these don't get used, but that definitely among some others was a viable invention that goes nowhere. In February, oh, and here they are in the preparedness parade. Now you can see it without me blocking Thomas Edison. In February of 1917, the Naval Consulting Board created a special problems committee to tackle the issue of protecting ships from surface attack. The committees received thousands of suggestions from the public, and I talked about the, uh, um, some ideas they'd gotten previously, other ideas uh, to protect them with shields and nets to protect, sub protect vessels from submarines, other ideas for camouflage and so um Smoke reduction to reduce the availability of ships were evaluated. They weren't practical and they weren't used. It's wasted a lot of time on looking at things from some of it, mostly general public that really could not ever be used. Despite his experiments, Edison grew agitated with the Navy for failing to utilize any of his ideas. As I told you before, he actually put 48 ideas and improvements, inventions, but the Navy did not develop them beyond the prototype st stage. And I told you about one. I don't know how many of them were practical, but I know there were quite a few that probably were that one in particular. And this is a smoke screen experiment conducted by Edison on the Long Island Sound in August of 1917. Edison accused them of lacking imagination or the foresight to see the usefulness usefulness of his work, excuse me. He wrote 1918, no one in Naval will do anything on account of taking risks that an innovation will bring in no training in Annapolis to cultivate the imagination. Of course, that's the Naval Academy. They weren't willing to risk things, try things he believed. And that is from um, Edison, World War I secret Navy experiment document, uh, that quote. But so they are not willing to take any risk. Step outside the box, try other things. And remember, Daniels doesn't want to be on the defensive. The technical research conducted by individual board members was more significant. Elmer Sperry developed improvements for airplanes and submarines, including a device to Protect hydrogen in submarines, which would be needed, improve steel, airplane propellers, and remote control devices for aerial bombs. Hudson Maxim improved contact mines and torpedo fuel. Peter Cooper Hewitt 
experimented on helicopters and Frank Sprague developed depth chargers, underwater fuses and armor piercing shells. And this is a Sperry stabilizing gyroscope installed in the USS Henderson. And this, uh, the last piece of that came from the US National Park Service article about Thomas Edison and military preparedness. The Naval Consulting Board was successful in achieving the political goals of Josephus Daniels, an expert politician whose political goal was to make Woodrow Wilson the first Democratic president since Andrew Jackson to win a second consecutive term. Daniel saw a political alliance with America's greatest inventor strengthened through the Naval Consulting Board to achieve his goal. So even though it's the idea of Hutchinson, Daniels thinks he can use it uh, to get Wilson reelected, but perhaps not necessarily to utilize the ideas that come out of the Naval Consulting Board or to utilize Edison's individual ideas. And remember, that could be considered a conflict of interest, but they're also using ideas from other individuals on the Naval Consulting Board. And by the way, um, Edison actually was interested in Teddy Roosevelt running again for president. That didn't happen. Both he and Ford are typically Republicans. Um, the support of Edison and Henry Ford, both Republicans, together with the money that Ford supplied for paid endorsement articles in the national new newspapers, may have tipped the balance in one of the closest presidential elections at the time in American history. They wanted a lot more. Edison's not donating any money for sure. Ford is a little bit of a tightwad, too. They had to convince him to do those paid endorsements, but he would not do anything else. In the fall of 1917, Edison moved his war research to Washington, D.C., hoping maybe to get more in contact with the Navy directly that way, at least the Naval Office. From October 1917 to January 1918, he used an office in the State War and Navy Building near the White House, now called the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. And I'm sorry that that was the best um, picture. It's a little blurry I could find from the time period there. Mina and a couple of staff members accompanied him. Remember, he always needs that help. He was collecting data on Allied shipping losses. Edison determined that the United States and the Allies were using pre-war shipping routes. Things that were already established would make it easier for enemy ship submarines to target ships. Many ships were passing through dangerous zones during the day. And he advocated the Allies change the submarine schedules to avoid German submarines. And, I, you know, whether or not that was utilized, I honestly don't know. I know the U.S. did not utilize it in later times. Growing tired of his extended say in D.C., doesn't like D.C., doesn't like politicians, doesn't like not being listened to. He's going to go where he can get do hands-on work again. So he is going to go to Key West. Remember, he has a home in Fort Myers, Florida, so he is most likely familiar with this. And this is a postcard picture um, from, it says Navy Docks, Key West, Florida. This is from 1901. So this is a few years later, but it gives you an idea of what it was like. And along with Mina and two experimenters, the group included Hannaford, a chief yeoman in the Naval Reserve assigned to guard Edison. Yes, he has his own guard. He proved valuable as an advisor on camouflage experiments and as Edison's sister, assistant and secretary in the absence of William Metacraft, who typically filled those roles. He, roles. he is there at bits and pieces during this time period for Edison, but most of the time he's back in West Orange. During their stay at the beginning of January, time and, time, Thomas and Mina stayed on base with the family of Commander Trout in a home that would later become known as the Little White House. And you know, that was President Harry Truman's place that he liked to visit. Edison was assisted by the men of the Sachem who arrived in February. The Navy, Navy also gave them the use of several engineers. And by the way, yeah, Mina would be there again some of the time, still not feeling totally comfort, comfortable when they're on the Sachem. 
and she kind of would escape back to Fort Myers when she could. But for a woman that oftentimes felt like it, she didn't have a role in Edison's life during this time period, because he's a workaholic, among other things, this time period, he definitely needed her. Mina Edison had gone away and she turned to Key West in April along with Charles and his new wife, Carolyn Hawkins. And by the way, Edison, they get married at, on the grounds of Seminole Lodge. And Edison, um, very spontaneous. Mina's not really happy about the new daughter-in-law, but that's a different story for another time. I don't think anyone would have pleased her in that way. But Edison is not coming back for Key, Key West for this wedding. But by the way, Edison remained in uh, Florida in an early April, he spent time on Man Key, where his son Theodore had been conducting experiments with one of Edison's employees. He had previously done some in New Jersey, and he kept Charles out of the war, by the way, because he claimed he had a severe hearing loss. And Theodore, who desperately wanted to sign up for military, but Mina has lost a beloved brother to uh, the Spanish-American War named Theodore. Her Theodore is named after him. There is no way she's going to allow him to to go to war. So Edison uh, says he needs him. And Theodore is the only one to graduate college, graduated from MIT and is an engineer. So that's what's happening with them. And he was working on a weapon he had designed himself, an unattached toothed wheel locate, loaded with TNT that Theodore designed to bite its way across the Western Front through barbed wire and explode in targeted trenches. It would keep him occupied and in danger because it is a little dangerous, even though he's not in the war for the rest of the war. And by April 19, April 23rd, Edison and Hannaford returned by train to New Jersey while the other team members came back aboard the Sachem. He transferred the remaining experiments to his garage at Glenmont. Of course, you know, we are in the war now. For about a year and a half, we were in the war. That Lusitania did it. <laughs> he continued working into the fall. By now, the end of the war was evident, but Edison continued to push himself on the Navy, um, demanding a vessel larger than the Sachem to test the latest of his underwater microphone. And he is pushing. He can, ignored the war's end in November 1918, and he continued to work until Assistant Secretary Franklin Roosevelt withdrew the Sachem from service in January and provided him with a rusty substitute ready to be demolished. What message must that have sent? Then that was withdrawn in favor of a yacht that did not have the 15 feet of a bow that he need, needed. Edison questioned if he was expected to end his marine experiments and on 9 10 19, so September 10th, to, uh, 1919, Roosevelt responded that due to economic concerns, they would not give him any further vessels. And Edison stated he was ready to return to private life. He sent the Navy a bill on November 13th, 1919, for the cost of his work involvement and ended. But they had told him up front they were never going to pay him. But now he's done all this research course for his company uh, um, and he was very hurt so his involvement ended but the hurt of the rejection of his 48 inventions remained um what if, i think it was meadowcroft that said you, that you kind of wouldn't have known unless you knew him how upset he was by this and hurt that the navy didn't accept some of his suggestions which probably uh, was a mistake on their part but Navy people, I don't think particularly liked working with civilians, that, that a civilian that had been foisted on them, even if it was Thomas Edison. I don't mean the enlisted men. I mean the people in the upper echelons of the Navy that could make those decisions. And here's the Naval Research Laboratory. A quote from Edison's uh, article in the New York Times. The government should maintain a great research laboratory jointly jointly under military and naval and civilian control. And, the, and this could be developed the continually increasing possibilities of great guns, the minutia of new explorers, explosives, all the techniques of military and naval progression without any vast expense. When the time came, if it ever did, we could take advantage 
of the knowledge gained through this research work and quickly manufacture in large quantities the latest, most efficient instruments of warfare. What happens to that Naval Research Laboratory? Well, here is what I'd like to tell you. Um, what happens with the uh, war continuing, the idea of this gains momentum. The board in October at their first meeting unanimously approved Edison's proposal, which called for a lab complex with complete equipment to enable working models to be made and tested to destruction. It would include a woodworking shop, a brass foundry, a cast iron and steel foundry, a chemical lab, a motion picture developing and printing department, and an explosive lab. It included a laboratory on the water where a ship could be docked near a large city, mainly run by civilians. And of course, Edison hoped to be involved in that. In 1916, Congress allotted $1 million, and roughly, because it depends on when that happens, so it can vary a little bit, about $28 million today for the new laboratory. And there's Edison in a laboratory of his which was less than the 5 million desired, which is what they wanted, which would have been about 140 million today. What they ultimately will do is allocate about a million and a half. The mayor of Baltimore put together a de delegation to meet with Navy officials and make the case for that city. Philadelphia expressed an interest as did New York. Most of the board wanted it on the Severn River near the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis because it would be a naval facility, while Edison preferred Sandy Hook, New Jersey, near his area. Many senior government officers preferred putting the lab in Washington so it would be close to the Navy Department. Those skeptical of the D.C. location said that the Potomac River was not wide enough or deep enough to accommodate the ships, the lab would require for its test. Edison, who was part of the committee on site, was determined to persuade the committee to recommend Sandy Hook, New Jersey as the ideal location. The rest of the committee wanted Annapolis along with a few uh, prominent military people, uh, naval people, but the rest of the naval people wanted DC. The rest of the committee uh, the recommended Annapolis, based on its proximity to Washington, they think that they'll make them happy. They'll have it right near the Naval Academy. And everybody signs off on it, except guess who? Thomas Edison. Nope, wants it in New Jersey. Not going to be in New Jersey, and it's not going to be in Annapolis either. Because of that delay that was caused by Edison, the Navy and Capitol Hill had leaned towards basing the lab in Washington. The sad ending of the Naval Consulting Board meant Edison gave his notice to Roosevelt, as you know, and Daniels pleaded with him to give his blessing to the lab to be built in DC. Edison would not. He was hurt by the experience regarding the lab and the board. And the lab finally opens on July 2nd, 1923. That means it's gonna have its centennial this year, Washington, DC. You can see on the grounds that they have a statue, a bust of Edison. Edison says, I made about 45, mil 45 inventions. We know it's to be exactly 48 during that time, during this, and they pigeonholed every one of them every one of them. So that was crushing for Edison. Um, and the ground wasn't actually broken till well after World War I in, on December 6, 1920. So they honor Edison there, but they didn't do what he had hoped they would do. And so I think Edison found this a very frustrating experience. What happened to Miller Reese Hutchinson? Well, after all the debacle about that battery, and then they were, Charles becomes president of Edison's businesses because Edison's off with the Naval Consulting Board or not, not really them so much as doing his research. And he does not tolerate Hutchinson well. 
And there, then there becomes a congressional ban on the conflict of interest, which Hutchinson obviously trying to sell those batteries that would have been if he's on the Naval Consulting Board. So eventually what happens, uh, it's, it's kind of a lobbying rule. Um, he gets bought out. It doesn't end well. The family, except for Edison, had never liked him. And I think they paid him out at like $112,589. And that was the end of him. So that's pretty much our story. I just would like to, um, next month, step into history, digital edition, don't miss it. The Corrections, celibate group led by a really interesting man named Cyrus T that convinced his followers the earth was hollow and it, their headquarters was right in Estero in Lee County, Florida, July 5th at 1030 my next digital discussion oh i please join me for this i i really feel passionately this, about this one theodore miller rough rider that's who mine is and thomas's son theodore edison's named after he's going to go off to war and be with teddy roosevelt and this is not a happy ending story um for it please join me for that and Go to edison4.org and click on the calendar. All of the online presentations are uploaded to YouTube. Search for them. And under Edison Ford Digital Discussion, you should be able to find them all. July 6th, in person, author Alexander Reimer, of author of Seduced by the Light, will be speaking about her book on July 6th at 10 o'clock. Books will be available to purchase and to be signed by the author. It will be held at South Florida Water Management, 2301 McGregor Boulevard, Fort Myers. You're all welcome. Technically, it is a volunteer meeting, but you don't have to be a volunteer to come. We'd love for you to come. Here's my articles, Rutgers National Park uh, Service and Edison by Edmund Morris, Phonographs to U-Boats, North Carolina Historical Review. There's lots of great sources. I thank you all. I got some questions and answers here. Let me see. Thanks for the very interesting backstory on the board, Dan. Edison was right about the Naval being high bound and inbred. Yeah, that could be true. And thanks, Holly. I learned so much. Thank you. Thank you for people that join me. I greatly appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you next month. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to end this now. Thank you for being here.